what, what, what's your rationale for holding treasuries right now? Are you betting on rates to fall or are you uh, betting on a uh, correction and you're there for safety? A treasury right now will give us two points over the inflation rate, Okay, which is really the greatest objective in all investing is to maintain buying power. That's number one. Number two, if you look at what's driving the market and this momentum investing and everybody's into that, you know, that typically doesn't work out. I have a list of 350 companies that went public between 1998 and, and mid-2000. And from their high to the low, the average decline was 91%. Ted Oakley joins us today. He is the founder of Oxbow Advisors, and he'll be talking to us about what he thinks is going to happen to the markets this year and why he's remaining defensive despite stocks having reached all-time highs. First, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you're over 18 and you'd like to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below to learn more and get started and benefit from these unique tax benefits that this IRA offers. Ted, welcome back to the show. Thank you, David. Uh, Ted, let's start with uh, your... I guess, positioning and sentiment for the markets overall. As you know, the major stock market indices, the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the Dow Jones have hit record highs earlier this year. Certainly, there seems to be a lot of euphoria around not just how stock markets are performing, but also uh, the possibility of Fed rate cuts this year. Are you still defensive like you were last year? Uh, in light of recent market movements, Ted? Well, David, we are. You know, this market is a momentum market. It's not a, you know, we're they're doing price now, not value. And when you get to these kinds of markets where it's all about price, people overpay, you know, they buy good companies. I'm not saying they're not good companies, but they overpay for them. And if you look at the average multiple on this, you know, MAG7 is 50 times. And I was looking yesterday at, um, at, Nvidia, 35 times sales. You know, you, you can buy good companies, but if you overpay for them, you'll never, in the long, long run, you won't make much money out of them. And, and everybody keeps talking about the new high. And I keep going back to this. If you go back to the third week in December of 21, and let's just say you do two things. You buy the S&P 500, I buy the 90-day treasury. Interestingly enough, okay, the S&P with dividend through through Friday was up about 9.7 and the, the 90 day treasury was up about 7.6. So let's say that you've got two points more for taking quite a bit of risk and then the up and down that goes with that. So when people talk to me about, uh, you know, I'm really knocking it out of the park, I'm gonna say in relation to what? You mean the last six months or your whole life or where are you coming from here? Right. <laughs> So well, that's kind of where we see it. We're still defensive, yeah, to answer your question. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back to your positioning in just a bit, but you brought up the Magnificent 7 stocks. Yes, okay, so we have to discuss that because the Mag 7 stocks have been pulling up the entire S&P 500. Um, it's significant because if you look at uh, X tech stocks, S&P, uh, not, up, not up as much. Russell 2000 has been flat all year round. Um, so would you evaluate the health of the economy or stock markets separately, independently from the stock markets, Ted? Well, we do. Uh, just to give you an example, we sort of have a two-prong market. I'm talking about economically, okay? In the recession side, you have commercial real estate, and now you're starting to see it multifamily really slow down. You look at mortgage applications, just hit a 30-year low, okay? So there's parts of the economy that are really, and are, are not doing that great. On the other side, you look at, Infrastructure companies are doing fantastic. You know, a number of these tech companies doing fantastic. So you really have a sort of a bifurcated GDP, and it depends on sort of where you land on those companies or where you are in those businesses to whether you feel like we're in a recession or not. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say you're defensive, what what exactly does that mean? Are you mostly cash? Are you short? Are you in defensive sectors? How are you defining that? We we when I say that we have if you think of all three strategies we have across mm -hmm. the board we're about fifty we average about fifty five percent in 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 treasuries now some of those are floating rates some are ninety days some are one year two year uh, a very small amount are further out 
we've we've really felt like this decade we're going to change from uh, a 60 40 type look for everybody to where you can only have about 30 percent in fixed income and that's probably going to have to be short term by that i mean less than 60 months so that's where we made a fairly significant shift and on the company side you know we own stocks but we own the stocks we think are valuable you know our average multiple is 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 much lower than the S&P multiple. I mean, we're probably somewhere in the 15 and a half range. And on top of that, these companies have low debt, they have high cash, free cash flow. We're all right with companies like that. There's just not a lot of them. I mean, if you go do a screen right now for us of 300 companies, we don't have many companies hit that number that we want. And so it's just, a. I mean, Warren Buffett said it best over the weekend. We can't find many things that are gonna move the needle. That was the exact word. So, you know what? I'd have to agree with that. 167 billion in cash and nothing to buy. Uh, we're not obviously not big like that, but it's still the same situation. Companies are really expensive generally. I'm, I'm just curious. We'll we'll come back to the, your market outlook in just a bit, but I, I'm curious as to um, how you develop your investing philosophy over time, over your very long career as a fund manager. How did you come to terms with the fact that you are more of a value investor? You pick companies with good valuations. You pick companies that aren't too expensive, like you just said, versus uh, a growth investor where you would probably chase momentum. And um, a lot of them have done quite well over the last year uh, if they were positioned properly. Um, why, why have you decided one over the other? Well, we really look at them the same. As an example, we own okay. – okay, we own – some Microsoft, some Alphabet, some okay. Amazon and Google, but we bought them when we were a lot cheaper. I see. So for new money, we don't add to those because we they're too expensive at this stage. That doesn't mean they can't come back in the zone, but we own those. But you know, we cut them back over time. Microsoft's our biggest holding, but we cut those things way down because they've gotten you know more expensive. And what we look for, our type of investors are people that want, do not want to take the big hit. In other words, if they're gonna go straight in to, uh, let's say the NASDAQ 100 or really these really pressing top seven, eight, nine, ten 10 stocks, then you've gotta get ready because they're gonna be highly volatile. And the type of people we do business with, that's not their style. They wanna know that, hey, we're not going to take the big, big giant loss. and. That's uh, we find that's where they want to go. A lot of people we do business with uh, have sold a company, they have a big liquidity event, and it's one of those things where they need to make sure they're okay the rest of their lives. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the ten-year yield or tre treasury yields. Um, uh, so let's talk about the ten-year in particular. It's been uh, on the tear all throughout two thousand twenty-three. Um, earlier in the uh, or later on in the year, uh, towards the end of last year, uh, the ten year fell from a high of five percent down to uh, you know three point eight percent. It's now on its way back up four point three. Uh, where is this trend headed from here? Where do you, uh, you think, Ted? Well, I, I never know for sure, and I'm not certain they know either. But <laughs> uh, you know, it's the one thing. But uh, I would, if I were guessing, okay, I would guess the reason we're keeping short maturities is because we feel like they do not have the ammunition to lower rates. And if anything, that 10 year would go up some, you know, we had a, when you got the PCE and the CPI that came out in January and probably to a degree in February, you know, they're in a rock between a rock and a hard place right now. And I don't think they are going to give wall street what they want, mm -hmm. uh, lowering these rates. So they may not, they may not lower the rates. I don't know. Uh, all, all I know is this. I know what we can own for one year and two years and make on it. I do know that. Um, but I don't know what on the 10 year. I think you're making a pretty big bet to say, hey, I'm going to take 4.2% and I'll guarantee you that's the best thing I can buy for the next 10 years. We Are don't you, agree with that. What, what's your rationale for holding treasuries right now? Are you betting on rates to fall or are you uh, betting on a uh, correction and you're there for safety? Well, it's twofold. One, a treasury right now will give us two points over the inflation rate, okay, which is really the greatest objective in all investing is to maintain buying power. That's number one. Number two, if you look at what's driving the market and this momentum investing, and everybody's into that, you know, that typically doesn't work out. You know, mm -hmm. I have a 
I have a list of 350 companies that went public between 1998 and, and mid-2000. And from their high to the low, the average decline was 91%. Now you can get caught up in this AI and a lot of these sorts of things, but you got to keep your head on straight and realize what you're buying. Because if you're not, you're buying a company that you're paying too much money for it, it still won't work out. That's what we keep saying. Uh, if I bring you in and you look at some of our companies and I go through the numbers with you, you'll say, I see that I'm a business person. I can see why you own that company. That's what's important right now. And there's just not, you know, there's not that many companies you can pull out. We have a number of them, but it's not like there's thousands of them out there for sure. If you're in it for the yield, Ted, would you consider high-grade corporates? We would if the spread was big enough, uh, David, because, you know, there's an old Wall Street saying if the spread is real close. In other words, if you're getting only getting a little bit for a corporate mm -hmm. over a treasury, then you buy the treasury. Mm -hmm. If the spread's really wide, if you can get a lot more for a corporate, then you buy you, you buy that. If I were doing anything, I'd buy the the tax free bond, probably over the corporate uh, right now. Not that they're they're okay, but if you look at most issues they're bringing the, the for the last year and a half, just look underneath. There's a call in there at twelve or twenty four months, mm -hmm. and you don't have a call on Treasury, so you, they can't take you out of the market if rates go back down. You have to keep that in mind. I see. Um would you favor the large caps over the small caps equities right now or vice versa? Well, we do because we look for companies that have really high cash, free cash flow. Okay. Their debt levels are low. You know, uh, we have added quite a bit more to energy in, in the last three or four months because uh, energy companies are, you know, they're, they're really putting less money into capital expenditures as far as drilling, et cetera. So we think that's something that you can look at the next two or three years. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you about uh, your view on the economy now. So over the last year, there's been obviously this recession fear that's been dominant in the headlines, probably the most anticipated recession um, ever, according to many pundits. Uh, some would argue it's almost here. Some would argue it's not coming. Some would argue we're already in a soft landing, what is your evaluation? I would say this, we thought, uh, the last time I talked with you, which was probably like last summer, I think, or something, we thought that we probably would have a weak quarter uh, by the fourth quarter or first quarter of, of, of 24. But what happened was the Fed came in, unfortunately, I think this is not good for people. They came in in October and, and gave everybody a lollipop to say, hey, you know, uh, everything's going to be okay and we're not going to raise rates anymore. And then they got caught in a squeeze now to where they can't do it. And so I, I don't think you're completely out of, out of the woods yet as far as not having a slowdown. I know people think you won't have, and maybe we're going back to a normal period where we just hang up here at 4%, three and a half, three percent inflation, but you could still get it because leading indicators has been a really good in indicator we just had the 23rd month, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know everybody now has said, oh, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. But they usually say that at that time. They always say the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I understand where they're coming from. 23 months of negative uh, LEI and still no contraction in the GDP. Um, you know, the argument well, you is have, that. You stop have to realize at what's in, in the GDP, though, David, if you look yeah. at it. The government supported the GDP last year. You pull government out, and it's a no. It's a no go. Okay. I mean, if you look at employment, and you look at what they spent and what they put in the economy, that's what changed that outlook. And everybody can talk about all this other stuff that's going great. Well, they're pumping the money in last year. Whether they can do it this year, I don't know. They're certainly trying to, but uh, you you can't keep having those deficits and running that money up before somewhere you're going to have trouble. And it showed up, by the way, last week in that treasury offering. Yes. Uh, you, uh, well, Oxbow Advisors um, on your YouTube channel, I'll put the link to your YouTube channel in the link, uh, the description below. Uh, you, There was a video that came out three weeks ago um, where uh, Chance Vanukin was giving a presentation and he ran through some slides. So uh, I'll just pull up a few that was of interest to me. So mm -hmm. the first is that... Um, uh, the manufacturing sector continues to weaken. There's a slide here that shows um, 
surveys from different feds showing weakness in the manufacturing sector um, all throughout December and January. Uh, certainly, certain sectors are doing worse than others or better than others, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, is is this are the services industries, manufacturing industries, are they something to be concerned about right now, or perhaps short or stay away from? You think? Well, everywhere I go, in terms of restaurants, most restaurants will tell you, and I could, we, you know, we're in different cities that. Generally, business is off a little. It's not any better than it was last year. If you look at the, you know, the walk-in traffic. Now, if you look at the Fed survey, in fact, a new one just came out Thursday and Friday, and this is all Fed districts, okay? And manufacturing just hit a new low. So will it keep on going and, and, and bring, bring people in? I don't know. It's not there yet, obviously, because everybody keeps spending money that they don't have. But on the services side, I think people got spoiled the last two or three years and they're like, hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to buy it. Even if I have to borrow the money, I'm still just going to spend money. And and I think that's where we are mentally now with people. Okay. Last year around this time, I remember uh, the regional banking crisis was unfolding. Um, several banks were under distress, as you remember. Hmm. Interest rates haven't fallen significantly since then. In fact, you know, as you know, it hasn't really moved since last year. Why aren't people concerned about banks anymore. I'm not seeing headlines of uh, regional banks under duress, given, you know, despite where interest rates are still, uh, still are, which is reasonably, relatively high, right? David, I think people in the banking business, by the way, has done a pretty good job of taking uh, depositors that were over 250 and getting them into areas, uh, even though it stayed in the bank, they've shifted them in areas where they were, they had better guarantees on them. In other words, not just the 250. I think that's helped them with the deposit side. That's one thing uh, that's changed it. Now, if you look at deposits, though, they're not really in community banks. They're not really growing, and their loans are not really growing either. They're not going down so much, but they're flatlined. And you get out in the, you just get out in the economy and talk to banks, talk to bankers, and they'll tell you that, hey, you know, it's it's a little slower out there right now, and their pipelines are declining. What happens here is this, if you go into a period the next year or two where banks, say mid-sized banks and community banks have to take write downs on loans that are not working, I think we're starting to see some of that. Here's the problem. If you take the write down and you have to bring in liquidity and you had to sell bonds that are already negative, all of a sudden your capital is blown up and you're gonna have to have a capital call. That's what I what I look for in this industry. I want to see if any of those things are happening. It's not happening yet? Is not your... yet, but you're starting to see it. You're starting okay. to see a lot of banks now that have been great banks over the last 10 years. But at this stage, because of their cost of funds and what they're doing on the loan side, they're either making no money or they're losing a little money. And these are banks that are pretty good banks over the years, you know, but I think what's happened in the banking industry is just, it's, a, it's obviously overregulated, but that's the squeeze that's going on right now. Okay. Uh, let's assume that the Federal Reserve doesn't lower interest rates anytime soon, like you said. In fact, the CME Fed Watch tool is predicting no cut until, well, no significant chance of a cut until June, but, but let's assume it happens June or later. Um, do you think corporate America can survive a high interest rate environment for another four to five months or perhaps longer without suffering any uh, significant damage to their margins. Well, the public companies can, David, because they all financed, you know, one of the good things about public companies, they, a lot of them financed it one and two. And so they're, even though they have some debt coming due, their average is not too bad. You know, their, their debt levels, as far as percentage of what it costs them, is not bad. Where you get into the trouble, is when you get out of the public companies and you get out into all the other industries, particularly real estate, where all of a sudden, and they've gone about as long as they can, but everybody with floating rate debt in these different industries that's let, that are leveraged and it's starting to come due now, and they've gone about as long as they can, and you know they they ponied up as much money as they had, but now I think a lot of them are going to start to have trouble. Um, trouble in terms of refinancing or trouble in terms of uh, sustaining their uh, cash flow. W can you can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, two twofold. 
if they have non-recourse financing, I can okay. see them just giving the keys back to the lender, whether it's I'd an see. insurance company or a bank. If it's non, if it's not non-recourse, let's say it's recourse financing. And by the way, there's not much of that out there because these banks were all vying for business. And so they did about anything the customer wanted. But if it's non-recourse, then that customer that's really backed those loans is going to have a pretty tough time because they're going to have to be paying a lot more cash. You, but you have a two-fold market, and most of the market's non-recourse, I should say. Um, and with that in mind, if it's not working, and I'm seeing this all over, they're starting to say, hey, you know what? It can't work, so we're just going to give you this building back. You, you own it now. I've been seeing charts that the global credit impulse has been declining. Are you observing uh, a shrinkage or slowdown in liquidity uh, where you live, anywhere that you've observed? Are people lending less? Are people borrowing less or more perhaps? How is how is the basically expansion of money based on your observation? I think nationwide people are, they're, they're doing two things. When rates went up, they had extra cash. So they've been paying those down because why would I want to pay eight and a half on a prime rate when I'm only getting, you know, five on a treasury? Mm. So they're paying those. There's one thing they're paying those loans down. The other side of it is they're looking at it and saying, you know, especially a small business, if I'm being prime plus one at nine and a half, I think I'll just wait on that loan. I'll think I'll wait a while. And I think really generally that's what's happening uh, unless they really, really need the money and, and they're growing so rapidly that they continually get the debt. But, if you look at it all out there, even the lower level equipment financing and that sort of thing, it, it's slowing down. Okay. So are you concerned about commercial real estate then? I know it's you know, jurisdiction specific, but I guess where you're based in Texas and anywhere else that you've observed? Well, Austin market, I don't think is any different from any of the other really hot markets that were Nashville, Kansas City, you know, places like that, that really were had hot, hot markets. And we're much like, I and mean, I'm starting to see it in Florida too now. And Mm -hmm. One of the things that happens is they really, we're noticing this now. The biggest thing we're noticing is that they can increase rents and the sublease, which is about, is really starting to show up big because these companies can't fill up the space they have. So they're like, well, for me to get some cash flow out of it, I'm going to have to sublease it. And when I, if I sublease it, I'm going to cut the normal market by 40 to 50% on that lease mm -hmm. rate. Now, when you start doing that, the people that have the brand new buildings, they're in trouble because they, they, they can't compete with that. Okay. All right. Well, let's sum up your uh, investment thesis here. So uh, in 2021 and 2022, obviously post-pandemic, we were worried about inflation and a post-pandemic recovery. Uh, last year, uh, there was a big market rally and we were concerned about inflation at the same time. 2022 was a big market sell-off. What is a major theme for 2024, we're two months in. Uh, what's next for us? What do you think, David? In our January market comments, we can, which you can see on our website, mm -hmm. we said that we expected the markets to hit a new new high. The mm -hmm. reason for that was because when you had that momentum going in right from October on, usually you get close to a new high and you're going to make a new high. It's just it's just what happens. Same way at lows, you make a new low when you get close. Um, and we felt like that would happen. It hasn't been a significant new high, by the way. It's been a new high. And we really felt like this year, which we don't know at all what could happen, but what we think might happen is you might have a new high and a new low this year. You might get both. Um, if if something happens where the, the momentum speculative nature of this market falls in, you have so much hot money and you can look at it in many, many different ways. You know, zero day options. You look at, you know, everything that goes into these, all the big names, margin, leverage, everything has up there. And you show up one day and everybody's out of the game. And so all of a sudden you could get something significant. I don't know. I don't know what will happen. I'll, I do know this though. I know we can own companies that we know are doing well. And I know what we can get in short term money. And we put those two together and if something does happen, that's not so great. We have liquidity and, and that will, that's where it really makes a difference is when you have, if you, if you have something go on, that's on the downside, you weren't expecting. If you have liquidity, you can take advantage of it. If you don't have liquidity, you're just going to be sweating. 
Yeah. And we don't like to be in that position. Okay. Um, you said that there's a possibility of new lows. You didn't say it's going to happen, but it's possible. What would trigger a correction? What would trigger this loss of momentum? In other words, what would be the top risks for the markets this year? Well, one of the top risks has to be the mid media, mid mid east right now. I I okay. think people sort of put it out of sight, out of mind. But if you look at it, that has to be one of the places that something could come out of the blue. Uh, I don't know that it would, but that would be one of the things that could happen. The other thing that could happen is a lot of times these momentum markets just run out of steam. I've seen it before. And all of a sudden, when they start correcting, people don't know why. They just they were just too expensive. That's really what it came down to. I'm not saying that could happen. And I certainly don't. <clears throat> I wouldn't want a headline that says I'm looking for new lows this year. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me to have that happen where, you know, that we've made a new high and we turn around and you give a lot of it back over the what we've gotten over the last 15 months. Uh, we'll see how it comes out. But I do know this. I do know things are expensive. Things are expensive. Was, would there be anything that you would say is in a bubble territory right now? Well, it has to be. It has to be this. It's the big seven stocks. Okay. I mean, again, you look at those multiples at an average of 50 plus, and I really compare it more to the nifty 50 than I do the 2000 because in the nifty 50, mm -hmm. you had 50 stocks and they were similar to these. Uh, they had high multiples, a lot of them really good companies. But again, you paid too much money for them. And so, you know, over the next three or four years, it just, you know, it just didn't work. I don't think you can pay. I don't think people realize that, that was a problem with Japan in 1989. You can't pay 50, 60, 70, 80 times earnings for companies and expect that yeah. to work because you're, you're expecting too much growth and a company can't, they can't produce that. Okay. Um, let's finish off on uh, a very interesting book that you worked on and are you're currently revising it. You told me offline. It's called 30 million and broke. Um, I think you've discussed um, personal finance and how to not lose your wealth, but I'll let you uh, summarize the book for us. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it called 30 million and broke? Most people would aspire to have 1 million, let alone 30 million. And presumably you would not feel broke. <laughs> <laughs> You know, David, that's such a that's a good question because what happens is people that have a liquidity event. Just to clarify, you're talking about U.S. dollars, not Japanese. Yes, yet. we're talking about U.S. dollars, right? <laughs> and uh, I, what we've seen over the years, over the decades, is this, and that is somebody has a liquidity event. It's usually selling a company, but it could be an inheritance. It could it's something where you have a really big liquidity event. And you don't give enough credence to how hard it is to put together that much money. It's, it's hard to put together 10, 20, 30, 50 million after tax. Very, very hard to do. And yet they come in and since that's happened to them, they get this sense, and it's mostly ego, by the way, uh, that, hey, I can do anything. I can buy anything. I can invest in anything. <laughs> Excuse me. And all of a sudden we look up and, and, and you'll look in the book, you'll see in the book where uh, they do all these things that should not be done and they look up and they can't even produce enough cash flow. And I've seen all the biggies. I've seen people lose 200 million, 300 million. I'm talking about to zero. Okay. And, and so you think, well, why would they do that? And I don't really have an answer for that other than the fact that there's something about them that doesn't feel comfortable just saying I'm okay with what I have. And, you know, there's a good book out there called The Number. It came out years ago, but it's about, am I okay with what I have? And I think what happens is you're just driving for something uh, that's there and they've let happiness get away from them because happiness is enjoying what you, where you are, what you have, your life, your family. And they, they forget that. I, I thought it was the other way around. Once you start enjoying life and you start becoming, I don't know if I should use the word complacent, that's when you lose focus of your company and your growth. And that's when you start sliding. No, not really. Most of the people that lose a lot are trying to do something different. They're, okay. they don't, they don't get the ego stroke anymore from owning a company. So they go out and buy three or four other companies. They don't know anything about, mm. you know, they buy a house in Aspen and one in St. Bart, buy a jet. All of a sudden they look up, cash is going out. None is coming in. 
And the next thing you know, instead of having 30 million, they have 10 million and then they have five. And see, they're used to producing this high cash flow. They had it in the business, but now they don't have it and they are in trouble. It's not everybody does that. A lot of business owners do great after selling. I'm not, but I'm just saying there's a group that gets a lot of money and they don't appreciate it. And, and they just, unfortunately for them, I, and I hate to see it by the way, but they spend it. What, what, what do they spend it on that, that is probably not sound financially? Well, first of all, they typically will go in and invest in, in two or three or four or five companies they know nothing about. They think they do. They think, well, okay. I, could, I could do my company so I can certainly do this other company. And they forget about sizing. I mean, if you want to go invest in a company, you have $25 million, it's okay to get, put two or 300 grand in it, but not 6 million, okay? That's what happens in these things. All of a sudden they start backing companies that don't work. Then they buy a lot of real estate that they really never use. Like I say, they, they buy a jet, they go overseas, they take yeah. to stretch. It's a lot of things. They try to support their kids. Um, there's a lot of multiple reasons that go into it, but one of the things I think that happens is they just, they think they can do it because they did it before. Okay. So who, who is wealthier at the end of the day, the, the, the man who makes a million dollars in top line revenue, but spends all of it or somebody who earns a hundred grand, but with very low expenses, you, you, you know, where I'm going with this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, in the end, the hundred grand person will be because they save. And if you save and you invest, you're going to be better off than the person could make a million, $2 million a year. If they spend it all, that won't work. And I think, I think people, people always forget about cash flow and how excess cash flow can be used to make yourself better financially. And that's what they should be doing, but they don't, you know, a lot of them think that, you know, I, I want to live this lifestyle, live this lifestyle. And yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, I see it a lot. Uh, what do the high net worth people do to protect their wealth? I'm not talking about the people who, I guess, are frivolous with their spending and wasted. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the people with actually 30 million in the bank, and it's not just cash because we all know what inflation does to the value of cash. What do they do with the 30 million? Well, you know, I wrote a book a number of years ago in, entitled "The Psychology of Staying Rich," it, which is on this subject you're talking about the okay. people that keep it. And it's interesting, I did a lot of interviews with people who had a lot of money, I'm talking about more than 500 million. And, and one of the things I found out about them is they're really, they're widely diversified. Most of them have a, like a third in real estate. They've got about a third in companies that they, they know the person. They always say this, I knew that person and that's how we got in that business. Or it was a related business that they had before. And a third of it is in financial assets. But the one thing in that financial asset part is that the average cash on those financial assets is about 35% or more, which tells me, unlike the small investor, that they don't mind holding liquidity and waiting for you know the big pitch to really hit it hard. Uh, and and that, that's what we found in that, in that study that we interviewed a lot of people and that's what we came up with. Do they have a lot of debt as well? Some of them do, but, if, but they have debt that produces. You know, if, they, if you have fixed debt and you have fixed revenue, you can make that asset really work. You don't need a ton of debt, but most of them don't have a lot a lot of debt. But if, if they do have debt, it's really strategic and it works. Okay, well, we appreciate your uh, insights and wisdom as always. Where can we learn more uh, from you, Ted? Read your books, learn about Oxbow. Well, the best place, David, the new book, 30 million won't be out till for about a month, but the others are there. And uh, you just go to the website, oxbowadvisors.com and almost everything we do, we're very transparent. Mm -hmm. is there. Uh, we're not we're not trying to hide a lot of things because what we do is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And you have a YouTube channel as well. So I'll put that uh, link in the description. Thank you very much, Ted. I appreciate your time. We'll speak again to our Oxbow advisors soon. Well, thank you, David. I'm really I'm really so uh, impressed with what you're doing. Thank uh, you. New channel. You've done a great job. Well, I appreciate it. It's because of great guests like you that um, I've able to sustain a good program. So I appreciate you coming back and supporting the channel. Uh, and uh, to the viewers, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like and uh, follow Oxbow Advisors in the link down below.